Thanks very much, Aaron. And uh, thank, thank you all. And for, for the previous readers, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a book all about science, about which I know very little. Uh, but what little I do know is in, in this book. Uh, some of it is science fiction, including this one, which is about Arthur C. Clarke, whose, whose books I used to enjoy, still do enjoy, 2001 A Space Odyssey, a few references to that in here. And it's called Once and Future. That's him, crossing the night sky above Manhattan, Sri Lanka, Boreham Wood. A UFO, you might say, although his own third law replies, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The boy from Bishop's Lydiard, a green man puffs his cheeks out in the church and Arthur sleeps within the hill, held his breath beneath homemade rockets, fireworks, until he broke into the new millennium, a sentinel, a spinning bone, a waltz. We've lost our wise men and are left with the rich who clamour like apes to be first to climb the skies. We had dismissed it all as science fiction until one day the moon rocked our certainty, computers shrank to the palm of a hand and we held the world enthralled. It was when the virus wrote its new version and the sea began to publish our future. We cling on aboard a vessel with no dialogue, only serious music and a computer having a nervous breakdown. He is safe though, deep among the silver. Uh, our daughter, uh, Katie, who's here, out there, I think, um, our elder daughter, uh, got a house in Barmouth recently, and we were visiting, and uh, I discovered, it was Ruth Padell told me, in fact, that Darwin used to go looking for beetles in Barmouth, so I felt I had to write a Barmouth Darwin poem. Barmouth, 1819, for Ruth Padell. Sea holly, sea rocket, sea spurge, Young Darwin is botanizing in the dunes of Merionethshire. While other late Georgians step neatly around the jellyfish, he prods and flips them over, hoping for any promising beetles. All the dogs return like comets when they scent bones and a beagle in his dream. It makes a moth line for the hills that captivate the town. Barefaced tellers of truth for how many hundred million years to his ten? I was at school, I, for some reason, I was asked to look after the maximum and minimum thermometer in the Stevenson screen. Perhaps we all did it for a few weeks at a time. Anyway, I remember doing that. And uh, this is a poem about it. In those days, it was all about the coming ice age rather than global warming. Max and Min. At school, we learned that an ice age or nuclear winter were on the way. I was responsible for the white louvered box, observing where its erratic upright markers had come to rest after their glacial ride on a flow of silver through the U-shaped glass. How cold it was, how hot, I noted down. Then with a magnet, reset them, ready for climate change. And another school one. Why is it that chemistry lessons always begin with drawing a Bunsen burner. I don't know, but I think they always have and probably always will. Uh, but Mr. Bunsen, or Professor Bunsen, did much more than invent the burner. And as a reference to that towards the end of this poem. Chemistry lesson. First, draw a Bunsen burner, showing how the inner blue of the flame is hot and the outer yellow cool, showing the barrel or chimney, its collar, which will regulate the flow, and this vital air hole, not to be confused with that one where a rubber tube hisses towards a stopcock. Then hand it in and wait for 50 or 60 years when you'll begin to wonder why it shows nothing of the man who discovered a deep blue poison in water and an antidote in rust, who's still splitting light, showing us all how if we'd only look up, we'd see what stars are made of. Well, yes, Omniscience is the title of the book, and it's because there's a long poem at the centre of it, a long sequence of, of three-line poems, playful poems, really, um, about every 
possible branch of science you can imagine. Um, so I'll just read some of those for you. Sports science. Conditions now favor the bowler. It swings past balmy asteroids through rings of stellar to where the final wicket hangs. Medical science is what you leave your body to so that when they find this little rhyme pump in your brain, they'll check if any poet has need of one. Marine science, as far from the sea as you can get, our field where the glacier dropped its silt rises to hold a wave there, a myth of the flood unscrolled. Social science, mass observation. In this unmoving carriage, no one calls for a poem by Charles Madge, social development officer for Stevenage. Science correspondent. Since the entire Apollo program is on your phone and nobody can be bothered to look up at the moon, it's no giant leap to say we might as well not have gone. Political science. Our chief political editor declares that a not very scientific poll now has the situation much where it always was. Skipping on a little way, beginning with economic science. Rejecting your old coins like unacceptable words, the car park machine spits out such duds as crown or sovereign farthings, groats. Military science, the drone that singles out a house, a room, a bed, knows what you're up to more accurately than God and is quicker at numbering hairs on your head. Psychological science. The young are misbehaving in midsummer's urban void, while this old man drifts off with Jung on Freud, a friendship which a single dream destroyed. Science prize. For the one who managed to levitate a frog, for the one who saw the dinosaur in a chicken's walk, for the one who analyzed the personality of a rock. Let's um, stop there and move on to a sonnet by Rilke. Um, there's another long sequence in this book all about alchemists, which is fairly obscure. Um, but this is rather lovely sonnet of Rilke's and not very well known. It's from his new poems, Neugedichter. Uh, so let me read you that. With a disturbing smile, the lab technician pushed back the smoky, halfway settled flask. He knew precisely now what he must risk to raise the long revered archaic vision within it. Epochs would be necessary, millennia for him and for this pear glass where it was brewing. In his own brain, stars were needed and in his consciousness, a sea. It left that night, this horror he had willed upon himself. He let it go. It turned back to God and resumed its usual bounds. But he, like a babbling drunkard, he sprawled across that secret compartment and yearned for those gold crumbs he'd seen beneath his hands. Just end with a little sequence of poems about Newton. Um, my wife and I visited Newton's uh, manor at, at Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire, it's not, not far into Lincolnshire, well worth visiting, uh, and the apple trees there and everything. So I wrote, I found myself wrote, writing a few poems about Newton. So a sequence of short, of eight short poems called Newton, surprisingly. Gravity. He did not discover it, he proved it. The tide at Teddington Lock recedes. They said, you're a magician, Isaac. The moon over his mother's grave at Colsterworth draws closer. No, he'll not deny the sun and respects always the father's absent authority. Optics. For two pounds a year, he has to be seen to believe in the Trinity. Time for a white lie to be split into its constituent parts. A rainbow 
arches from Lincolnshire to the Mint. He was, he was warden of the Mint for a while. Three laws. That a fire in the laboratory is never extinguished. That it is the error unlocks the genius. That whoever pokes a bodkin in their eye sees best. Astronomer Royal, this is one of Newton's many enemies. Uh, he treated him very badly. So this is in the voice of the Astronomer Royal. I observe the man. He comes to the full and his flaws show. Sea of unkindness, mount arrogance. In my star catalogue, his place is assured. Ambitiosus, insidiosus. But I am obliterated from his universe. Trinity Street, this is in Cambridge. Outside the haunted house, crowds would hear him as he passed, mere cheats and impostures. Back in his rooms, working, he continued to ghost any other scientist who tried to get a look in. Warden, the moon, uncounterfeited as yet, saw how a dark glove reached over to clip its edge and scatter the silver so the stars came out. At Tyburn, gravity claims another coiner. At the Mint, Newton has insisted on a raise. King's Cross. The train at Platform 1 is the 1642 to Grantham. All about me, the world balances. The horse pulls against the stone and the stone pulls back. Epitaph, and this begins with the end of Pope's famous couplet about Newton. And hence the light bulb on the cover, Aaron's wonderful cover. And all was light. My light bulb starts to flicker. His candle too. A message from the maker to both of us that hiding at the back, there's something does not want to leave the dark. Thanks for listening.